Still one minute. To... Exactly. <laughs> There's lots of people here. Ah, Maxime, il n'y a pas. So, so, Perfect. Well, five. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, and if you, and, and by 30, 30 zero, you really should be. Yeah. Um, you should be done. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, I'm Anne Vera, I'm working at Geneva University, and uh, I'm involved in several, so I'm doing simulations, radiation transfer simulations with uh, several people, mainly uh, in collaboration with Lyon, and um, people in Lighty are those in the room. I'm also working on detecting Lyman continuum emission from, from local galaxies with HST, with another team of people, and I'm also part of the MUSE consortium. So um, this is the outline of my talk. So I will present recent results on the escape of Lyman continuum uh, from galaxies, and then uh, um, explain how to use Lyman alpha to trace Lyman continuum escape from galaxies, and finally present um, the properties of the Lyman alpha properties of virtual Lyman continuum emitters. Well, actually, the result from a, a pilot project that we are well, a study, which is ongoing with Maxim. Okay, so cosmic reionization is the major phase transition in the history of the universe, and it had a strong impact on the formation and evolution of galaxies. What we know is that uh, reionization lasted over the first Chigaya of the universe. What we don't know, however, is the nature of the sources. As we heard this morning, massive star stars in galaxies may be the sources of cosmic reionization because they produce a lot of ionizing radiation, also called the Lyman continuum, this is all radiation emitted at wavelengths shorter than 912 angstroms. And um, so the condition to be the sources of cosmic ionization is that at least some of the ionizing radiation that they produce can make its way through the interstellar medium of these galaxies until it reaches the IGM in order to reionize it. So several teams have tried to observe the Lyman continuum emission from galaxies, but it's a well-known uh, uh, observational challenge. And, um, well, several non-detections were, were reported uh, over the past years. 
actually galaxies, low redshift galaxies seems to be opaque to their own ionizing radiation most of the time. And at higher redshift, people were confronted with uh, another problem, which is uh, contamination by foreground objects. So lots of false detections. And before 2016, uh, only very few detections were known in the local universe. But things have uh, drastically changed over the past two years, um, as witnessed uh, by the number of people in the room compared to uh, when we organized this meeting two years ago. And it seems that the community of people interested in Lyman quantum leakage from Galaxy is growing rapidly. And so far we have like uh, 14 um, objects known, Lyman continuum emitters, at redshift below 0.4, and four objects from redshift 2 to 4, plus the new, uh, um, new results which are reported uh, uh, even over the last months and some other, some new results to be reported during this conference, I think. So why is the highest uh, redshift detection uh, four so far, whereas reionization happened at redshift uh, six? This is because uh, it is impossible, well, because of the, the, the IGM opacity is increasing with redshift. So it is impossible to directly observe Lyman continuum escape from galaxies at the epoch of reionization. And that's what we need to invent and validate in direct diagnostics to probe the escape of Lyman continuum from galaxies. So this is the typical spectrum of a star forming galaxy um, for different escape fractions. So this is a synthetic model, uh, as was discussed this morning also. And so the, the main difference in the, in the different spectra is obviously at the Lyman continuum age. Um, but the game is to find on the radar side um, spectral characteristics which are linked to the change of the Lyman continuum so that when, when this part is not observable, you can trace Lyman continuum escape from, from other properties. And so far in the literature, three main probes have been proposed. Um, the very prominent Lyman alpha line in the UV rest frame of the, of the galaxies. Um, an inverse ratio of the O3 over O2 uh, nebula emission lines um, as a proxy for density bounded H2 regions. And it was discussed this mo morning with the ionization parameter techniques, which is uh, actually to specially resolve this O3 over O2 ratio. And uh, the strengths of the UV absorption lines as proposed by uh, T. Ekman, for example. And this relates the, the depths, the strengths of the absorption um, to the kinematics and the porosity of the neutral gas um, in front of, well, between the stars which shine in ionizing radiation and us. Okay, and there's, there's a nice redshift window around redshift 0.3 where you can at the same time observe these three indirect probes and go for direct detection of Lyman continuum leakage thanks to the actual facilities, which is with HST. So with a team of collaborators, we searched through the SDSS database and uh, collected a sample of 11 galaxies with the right redshift to be efficiently observable with, with COS and an inverse ratio of the O3 over O2 in the SDSS optical spectrum for these galaxies. And very compact galaxies so that the cost aperture would cover the entire galaxy. And we observed them in Lyman continuum and in Lyman alpha. And the main result of these studies is that out of, uh, 11 out of the 11 galaxies that we observed are actually Lyman continuum leakers with uh, escape fraction regime from two to, 30 to 73 persons. And uh, I guess that this sample will be uh, discussed in more detail in uh, Daniel Stoke and John Stoke and also uh, check uh, Simon's poster outside. So about the link between direct detection, direct Lyman continuum emission and indirect probes, this is what we find. So um, they expect, so there's not, not exactly a correlation between 
O32, the, the strength of the O32 ratio and the Lyman continuum escape fraction. Actually, our object with the highest O32 ratio is a leaker. It has a, a Lyman continuum escape fraction, but it's not the strongest. And our highest Lyman continuum leaker with the highest escape fraction has um, an O32 um, ratio, which is in the same range of other with lower escape fractions. Um, we find a trend with mass, or at least our galaxy with the strongest uh, escape fraction has the lowest mass in our sample, but these are still small, uh, small sample statistics. And the best correlation is between the Lyman alpha peak separation and the escape fraction of Lyman continuum. I'll come back to this point, as expected by theoretical predictions. Okay, so how to use uh, Lyman alpha to trace Lyman continuum. So first of all, Lyman alpha is a very strong line. Um, galaxies are actually good machines at converting their ionizing radiation into all the uh, recombination lines of hydrogen, Lyman alpha being the strongest. So for, for young um, galaxies, up to 40% of the bolometric luminosity of galaxies can be converted into Lyman alpha. This is a resonant line which means that after cascading back down uh, the recommendation cascade, Lyman alpha photons are stuck in the, in the resonance here. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of um, hydrogen in galaxies, so Lyman alpha photon will diffuse huge amount of times before escape. By chance, it's a, res it's a UV line. So the same, um, spectral feature can be observed from galaxies in the local universe using HST to probe it in the UV and then rechefted in the optical range, for example, to be observed with MUSE and then above redshift 6 obs observable in the infrared. So the same uh, Lyman alpha can be used as a tool to probe the whole history of uh, galaxy formation and evolution with the same probe. Okay, so um, two slides on uh, quick radiation transfer effects, like how, how to interpret Lyman alpha profiles that you see from galaxies. So about Lyman alpha kinematics. So Lyman alpha is, is never tracing the line of sight velocity as would uh, an absorption line do or even an emission line which traces the systemic redshift of, of the emitting gas. Lyman alpha traces, on the contrary, Lyman alpha traces the, velo the bulk velocity of the, of the gas in which it diffuses compared to the source, the Lyman alpha source. So if Lyman alpha is scattering into a um, static medium, then it will create a double peak because it has to get out of resonance, but bluer or redder is symmetric. When, when Lyman alpha is um, scattering in an outflowing medium, then if it gets red, it gets out of resonance. So by selection effect, um, the profile will, will, will shift, shift to, to be, a, well, will be red shifted with an asymmetry towards the web. And the contrary, when the, the scattering medium is infalling onto the Lyman alpha source. And about the density, so when the medium is, so here is, <laughs> Like I, I uh, hand draw uh, three cases of different uh, opacity. So a medium which is more optically thin, the Lyman alpha profiles will, well, the Lyman alpha photons will need to go less far in the wings to be able to escape. And so the peak separation will be smaller. And if you increase the opacity of the gas, if there is more, more gas to diffuse into, then the Lyman alpha photons will have to uh, go further in the wings to be able to escape. And at the same time as the profile, so the, the, the peaks shift uh, away from line center, the peaks also, the, the distribution of the peaks broaden. And since the peak and the, 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 the width of the peak and the location of the peak are linked by radiation transfer effect, you can rely on the width of the line or the, the separation, if, you, if you're lucky and you have uh, Lyman alpha profile with two peaks, then you can m measure the peak separation as a proxy for the systemic redshift. 
And when you have a single uh, line, you can measure the, the width of the line as a proxy for the peak shift. And these are a collection of um, Lyman alpha profile in the literature for which another line is known. So the systemic redshift of all these galaxies is well known by either, well, another nebula emission line. And, uh, and the shift of the red peak compared to the known systemic redshift is plotted over the two proxies that I propose for recovering the systemic redshift. And you see that there is a dispersion around this, this line. This is the, the, the black line is the one-to-one -one relation. But you, you can recover systemic redshift from Lyman alpha with a dispersion of 100 kilometers per second with these techniques. Okay, so let's come back to Lyman continuum escape from galaxies. So there are theoretical expectations. For example, on the spectral shape, Lyman continuum leakers should have narrow profile and small delta V. On the escape fraction, Lyman alpha escape fraction should be high from Lyman continuum leakers. And spatial extent, I would predict like very compact, not extended Lyman alpha halos around Lyman continuum leakers. And uh, I will use the observations that, is, that are known so far to compare with the theoretical expectations. So about the spectra. So this is like the, the usual cartoon of Lyman continuum leaking galaxies. Imagine that you're looking at a Lyman continuum leaking galaxy. Either you're looking at a galaxy which is forming star in ionization bounded uh, H2 regions, but you're looking through a peculiar direction where there's a hole. And so you see the direct Lyman continuum emission from the stars escaping. So this is one scenario. Or you could imagine that you're looking at a galaxy which is strongly uh, forming stars and producing enough ionizing radiation to have photoionized our entire ISM. And then you are looking at density bounded nebula. In both cases, if you do Lyman alpha radiation transfer models, you'd expect uh, spectral signatures that you can, you can check for or you, you can look for. So in the, in the case of holes, then you'd expect that Lyman alpha will find the holes very efficiently because Lyman alpha is a resonant line. And so you, you, you escape the, the system if you stay at resonant. And so Lyman alpha will be, well, the Lyman alpha profile would be at systemic. And this is also, uh, so this was for, uh, yeah, homogeneous shells with holes, like uh, idealized galaxies. But the same results hold in a clumpy uh, sphere. So this, this is a, a spherical volume full of uh, small clumps and Lyman alpha scatter on the, on the clumps. And you see that uh, for yeah, lines of sight, well, when the Lyman continuum escape fraction, there's also a peak at zero. Um, in the case of the density bounded H2 uh, uh, scenario, since Lyman alpha is very sensitive to the, to the column density of the scattering medium, you're looking for profile with the least, with, which are the least redshifted uh, compared to systemic to trace low column densities, the regimes where Lyman continuum can escape. And you see that the peak of the profiles nicely correlates with the the column density of the scattering medium. Or in a more quantitative way, this is shift of the, of the maximum of the profile versus column density for a grid of models um, with different parameters. And yeah, so there's, there's a, there's a so, um, low column density regimes, all the emergent Lyman alpha profiles from low column density regimes have very low, very small peak shifts. And indeed, if you, if you look at observations, so the Lyman continuum leakers of the local universe that I discussed before, they all have double peak profiles with small peak separations. And um, there's a one, well, so far I'm aware of a single profile with a triple peak with uh, Lyman alpha at systemic redshift. And I would bet that this galaxy is uh, Lyman continuum leaker. We may hear more about this on, the, on Friday. And uh, 
this is like a galaxy with 46% of escape, very small peak separation, and our strongest Lyman continuum emitter with 73% has even smaller peak separation and even a triple peak maybe resembling this one. Okay, so once again, we find, so the, the, the main result of our, well, we checked uh, with what Lyman continuum escape was uh, correlating, and the strongest correlation is, is found between the separation of the, of the peaks of the Lyman alpha profiles and the Lyman continuum emission from, from these galaxies. Um, but, so for, for, from this, it seems to, to work everything well. The models predict that, and that's what we find. But there are also um, other Lyman alpha profiles in the, of uh, leakers at high redshifts. So the um, quality of the data are, are, are less good, the, the spectral resolution are lower, and the signal to noise are lower because it's much harder to observe high redshift galaxies. But the Lyman alpha profiles seem to be more complicated than the one I just described. So, and also, with uh, in, in the inside the Muse collaboration with um, Josie Kerut, the PhD student of, of Lutz, we are working on um, checking, so knowing the redshift of Lyman alpha emitters detect detected with Muse, and we are looking at probing their Lyman continuum emission from um, an HST survey conducted by Pascal Eusch, and we found some candidates for Lyman continuum emission. But when we check the correlation of the Lyman alpha properties with these detections, it's much less clear than what I showed on the local leakers. And in particular, the peak separation do not, so this is like the um, individual detections, the, the orange stars, and these are stacks. And uh, we seem to have some detections with broad peak separation. But we discussed with uh, experts of uh, um, UV data that maybe some of our uh, detections uh, well, have to be conf confirmed. This is work in progress. But it may be mo more complicated than what we see in the local universe. Okay, about escape fraction, we expect that the Lyman alpha escape fraction would be always higher than the Lyman continuum escape fraction, except when you have extremely high uh, Lyman continuum escape fraction above 80%, where you start to produce less Lyman alpha emission. And that is what is seen on the, on, the, on the models, and the data also show that Lyman alpha escape fraction is higher than Lyman continuum escape fraction for our local leakers. This is the one-to-one -one relation. About the spatial distribution, so Lyman alpha is a resonant line, so it will be emitted from the, it is emitted from a source, but then it will diffuse, and so the Lyman alpha image from a galaxy will always be much bigger than the, than the uh, image of the stars, for example. And this is, what is shown here is uh, the Lyman alpha spectrum of um, an expanding shell with a point source. And Lyman alpha is emitted in the middle, and I increase the size of the aperture. So first looking at uh, the, the spectrum emerging from the very center of the shell and increasing to, to get more and more scattered light into the aperture. And this is the, a 2D spectrum, so wavelength versus radius of my, of my um, shell, and you see that the Lyman alpha profile is a, is a double peak in the halo, and the Lyman continuum, and the continuum is, is escaping only from the center where, where I put it, the continuum. And so this, is, this varies, so the amount of scattered light versus direct escape from the center will depend on the colon density, and uh, so I show three examples with ranging like two orders of magnitude difference in, in density between the different models. So this is like a Lyman continuum regime, a typical LA and uh, an LBG regime, uh, a schematic view just to, to, yeah. And this is like the central sp spectrum which is in emission and the um, scattered light which is in, yeah, a double peak. Whereas when you go to lower colon densities, already from the center you get 
limel alpha emission, direct limel alpha emission. So my expectation would be that, like, and actually in, in the, in the limel continuum um, regime, the scattered light is less than 30% of the total limel alpha line. Most of the line escapes from the center. These are isolated um, geometries, but this is just to um, yeah, get a handle on how, how to interpret data. And indeed, well, so then I checked in the literature if limel alpha images of limel continuum leakers exist. And there is one in the local universe where limel alpha seems to be very compact. This is the surface brightness profiles compared between limel alpha in dark blue and the UV. And you see that limel alpha is more extended than the UV, but still uh, the central part, which is the, the most of the luminosity coming from the central part, has similar slope than the, than the center. Uh, another way to, to test that is the work from uh, Francesca Marchi on the foods data, where she stacked uh, um, flux ratios between the continuum and the, and the UV non-ionizing for different stacks depending on their limel alpha properties. Sorry. And uh, the main difference that they get is when they stack uh, for the special extent. So the most compact sources have the highest excess in ionizing radiation compared to the, to the extended sources. Okay, so then I'll present uh, some results about simulations. So to do the simulations, we use a new uh, version of uh, my former code, which is called RASCAS, which has been, uh, ma which is a massively parallel Monte Carlo code for line transfer in AMR simulations. It is coupled with Ramses RT. And um, you can, it's very modular, so you can obviously do Lyman alpha, but not only, you can also transfer metallic resonant, resonant lines, but also dust scattering of the stellar lights, Lime and continuous escape fraction, and it will be uh, released soon. And with this new code, so I computed the Lime and alpha properties of a virtual uh, dwarf galaxy at the epoch of reionization. This is its uh, um, so a work from Maxim Trevich, where he showed that galaxies in, in at the epoch of reionization have very variable in, uh, so the escape of ionizing radiation is very variable in time. Sometimes they are, limen continuum emitters, and most of the, of the time they are not. And so I computed the limen alpha pro, um, properties of this galaxy over the last epoch of limen continuum leakage, where it reaches an escape fraction of 70%. And this is what is shown here. I don't know if you can see the small red dot here. So it's uh, going through this, uh, so this is escape fraction of Lyman continuum versus time. And this is the Lyman alpha profile which corresponds to each of the snapshots. And you see that, ah, okay, so now it's too late. But. So the, the peak separation was nicely shrinking and then you, ha you, you get a single Lyman alpha emission peak at the maximum of the Lyman continuum escape fraction of the Lyman continuum phase. Another way to plot it, is, this is like, uh, Lyman alpha, comparing Lyman alpha and Lyman continuum escape fractions with time. And you see that, so the Lyman alpha escape fraction of this galaxy is always high, around uh, 50%, and it reaches 100% when, when this galaxy is leaking ionizing radiation. And this is like a, yeah, a movie of the line profiles. And um, the, all sky maps of the direction of Lyman, continuum, Lyman, Lyman alpha escapes. And when, when the, the galaxy is starting to emit ionizing radiation, so it seems that the Lyman alpha escape, escape is less homogeneous when the galaxy is not a Lyman continuum leaker than when it is a Lyman continuum leaker, then Lyman alpha can escape from every direction. And I compared the peak separation and the shift of the red peak with the data from our local leakers, and they fall on the same line of the plot. So the strongest leakers from the simulations are here, where the peak separation is small, and the, well, the shift of the red peak is small. And um, this is 
peak of shift of the red peak versus escape fraction, limen alpha es escape fraction, colored by limen continuum escape fraction, and again the, the simulation well, the phase where the, the galaxy is strongly leaking is, is here, and the data are following the trend. And uh, yeah, this is the conclusion of uh, my talk. So, oh, well, I can. So, in, in this experiment, <coughs> yes, yeah, so I, I take the young stars as our proxy for H2 regions, and I, I launch a continuum plus a Gaussian, which with, with, and each star particle has its own motion, and so it just, uh, it, the, so the lime alpha lines will be emitted with these motions. Does it answer you? Yes. So the actually the, the the shape of the profile does not change much with radius. So this is like at the center of the shell. This is the, the spectrum, and when you go above the, the like, where, where there is continuum emitted, then the whole shell is emitting the same kind of profile with, a, with this peak, which is here. And what I do here, the question is how I build this, this film, right? So I just grow the aperture on the shell, starting from, from on the source, on the stellar continuum, and just increase the size of the aperture to collect more and more scattered light. Can I follow up? Because uh, uh, the one earth, uh, the sea, you see some change in the ratio, but here the ratio of the red peak seems to be increasing. What could be, can you explain that? Um, well, so the blue peak indeed, uh, Kind of appear in the halo. Well, there's not much blue peak in this, in this with this uh, particular um, sets of parameters. But um, I don't see really a change in the whole halo, and I think that's because um, this is a homogeneous shell, and it's enlightened by from the center, from a yeah point source. If you had like in order to reproduce uh, Dawn's data, I, it seems like the in the external part of the of the halo, the peaks are less separated than in the center, and so they may well. I, I would say that the limen alpha source has to be extended in this case, and maybe, yeah. I don't know who. When I have a large, so, so are you talking about the, the um, this this experiment? So just a. No, I haven't. So I have. I, I I took the same Gaussian for all st stellar particles. Yeah, that's true. I I, I did not. Co but um, no, that's a good point. Even even with uh, seventy percent of escape, I I I assume the same intrinsic uh, um, profile for each star particle. Which, yeah. 
the dust grow? The dust grow. Well, dust, dust destroys UV light, so limonyl alpha is UV and resonance, so dust, af dust destroys and scatters limonyl alpha. It is included in the, in the model, yes. yes. <coughs> My name is uh, Axel. I work with uh, Matt Hayes and, and uh, Lars Collaboration in, in Stockholm. I've been working on my PhD there for about a year. Uh, and uh, my main focus has been to try to predict, as I say, the Lyman alpha emission of our sample of uh, star bursting galaxies. And as has been repeated quite a number of times at this point, that if we can understand the Lyman alpha line, we could have a, a very powerful tool to understand what is going on in, uh, in the universe at the uh, era of reionization. Because, as we, as we have said, Lyman alpha is impacted by the neutral hydrogen gas. So as the neutral fraction of the IgM goes up, we would expect Lyman alpha to drop off. But we can only do this, well, if we, if we actually know what kind of Lyman alpha is emitted. We, otherwise, we have nothing to compare our measurements to. Uh, so this is a, a figure from the Burroughs 2017, just showing the fraction of, of Lyman alpha emitters um, in the, as a function of redshift. Uh, this this shows that, uh, or it gives an indication that the um, neutral fraction of the of the IGM is is indeed increasing because the fraction of Lyman alpha emitters is dropping off at higher redshifts. So Lyman alpha is being probably intercepted somehow. So if we want to understand Lyman alpha, what we ideally want is some quantity that we can observe from our galaxies that is not impacted by the neutral IGM that allows us to say, okay, this galaxy should be emitting roughly this amount of Lyman alpha and then compare to what we actually see. Uh, so the, the basic way you would do that is look for, for correlations with all the other observable properties of a galaxy. So Matt did this and, and a lot of other people have done uh, for a lot of observable quantities. So this is from his 2014 paper. What you're seeing here is um, the luminosity in the far UV versus a number of Lyman alpha related quantities, uh, escape fraction, uh, equivalent width, etc., etc. And you can do this for, this is, um, intrinsic star formation rate from H alpha, you can do it for the equivalent width in H alpha or the nebular EBV. And in general, yes, there is correlations. You can find correlations in these plots, but you can also find a lot of noise. There's a lot of scatter. Whenever you do this, you find a lot of scatter in, in the plots. Um, but we have, as, as is demonstrated slightly here, but we have access to a lot of, of data in the LARS uh, project. So we have 42 galaxies in the LARS and ELARS with um, a very broad range of, of observations in general. We have 21 centimeter H1 mass determinations. We have uh, HST broadbands, synthesized narrow, uh, Lyman alpha narrowband from those. We have uh, HST narrowbands, optical spectroscopy, UV spectroscopy that allows us to get the outflow measurements and things like this. So why would we look at only one variable is in general the question. What if we can look at more than one set of information at a time? So this isn't unique uh, trying to do this. This has been done uh, before. I think the most well-known example is the fundamental plane of galaxies this is, uh, from Bernardi 2003. Just showing an example of, of 
the, having a correlation that is scattered and then adding in a, a third variable can give you a plane which is suddenly gives you a much smaller um, deviation from, from the relation basically that you can fit. Um, so can we do this with, with uh, what we have? And the answer is, well, yes we can, but we have to choose our method and how we do this. Uh, so we started by looking at, at physical quantities, let's call it, uh, stuff that has been usually looked at when you look at these types of, of correlations, um, stuff that's easily interpreted, maybe, I would say. So things like the uh, star, uh, stellar mass, the ionization parameter, oxygen-322 has been discussed a few times, uh, the star formation rate, UV size, metallicities, uh, outflow properties and stuff like that. Uh, and then what we did was, our problem is basically we have one variable that we want to predict. We want to predict the Lyman alpha luminosity. And then we have a lot of variables that contain information about this. So what we choose to do, or chose to do is to do a multiple linear regression basically. The simplest model that you can fit to all these data. Uh, just a line through all of them, a linear combination of all of these variables to see, okay, if we include all of them and optimize to try to predict Lyman alpha, what can we find? So with this variable set, what we find is this. So what we're looking at here is uh, the Lyman alpha luminosity on, uh, in yeah, log 10 units um, on the y-axis and the prediction uh, from our linear regression on the x-axis. And this is, this is sort of promising. This thing, this relation has an R-squared value of 0.63, so this means, roughly means that we're, we're explaining 63% of the variance in the sample. So this is encouraging. This looks better than any of the individual correlations um, by far. Um, but there's still, there's still noise in this, uh, this um, relation. There's still a bunch of outliers. Um, so the question that then came up was, well, how can we improve upon this? Well, one source of, of uncertainty in, in all of these variables that we have on the side is, is calibrations from all our, yeah, the standard observations or calibrations that we use to derive them. These are not direct observables. Uh, and the question is how would that, how do these things impact our, our relations if they're not quite correct or whatever noise do these calibrations add, basically. So, and we don't know, it's hard to quantify or virtually impossible. So what we can do then is to try to just say, okay, let's not use any of these uh, derived quantities. Let's instead go and look at direct observables. Whatever we can observe directly with a telescope to see, can we predict from that? So we got um, another, pulled out another data set from our, yeah, from our data uh, with uh, far UV magnitudes, UV sizes, some uh, spectral line measurements, uh, with the velocity, outflow velocities are still here because they are direct measurements from uh, spec the UV spectra. And then we did exactly the same exercise. The, the framework is exactly the same. And what we find is this. Uh, we find a very nice relation here. We can quite well predict um, the Lyman alpha. As you can see, the R squared in the corner there is 0.82, which means we explain over 80% of the variance in the sample uh, by, sudden, by using uh, all of these variables. And then the obvious question becomes, oh, but you're so, there's so many variables, there's so much observation that obviously needs to be done to predict this, what can we do about that? So what we set out to do then is to try and, and set an order of priority. Which variables are the most important um, in order to, to make this prediction? What contributes the most information? Uh, and the, the process, uh, you can see the list there, for, first off, that's the ordered list of variables. 
in, in terms of importance. And the process that we used uh, to, to get at this list um, is known as forward and backward selection of variables. So what you do, forward selection is basically the same, thank you, uh, is basically the same as, as what you would do if you examined the correlations manually. You fit one variable, you look for each one of your variables in your set, you check which one has the strongest correlation, and then uh, you take that as your first variable. And then you add on all the other ones and see which one improves my relation the most, okay, this one, etc., etc., and then you get something like this. Um, and we can also estimate the, the sort of how sensitive this is to, to our, the galaxies in our sample. So what we do is we, we exclude uh, a galaxy from the sample, we refit, and then you see the distribution of these rankings as you do this a, a number of times. Um, and they're a bit noisy, but the imp most important thing from this is that the, most, the variables that contain the most information, the far UV magnitude and the UV size, uh, are very, very heavily peaked to the left. And as you go down the list, it, in general, it peaks further and further to the right. So what you have on the x-axis in this diagram is just uh, the ranking in, our, in our, uh, what I showed you previously. Uh, so it's very interesting to see that the far UV and the UV size you can use, they are always important for all our galaxies and they are also contribute a very large fraction of the information in our sample. So this is very encouraging, right? We can, so we have a relation that can be used to predict the Lyman alpha luminosity from our galaxies. And uh, we can, in principle, do this for high redshift galaxies. Most of these things are actually observable. Uh, and we can, we can get, probably we can get some sort of measure of the neutral fraction of the IGM. Uh, obviously, I mean, this importance that I showed you last is, is, is there to be able to prioritize it. So we can show which, which of these quantities is truly important. If you apply for an observation, what should you go for? When you, when you go into the era of, of the ELT and the JWST. Uh, so my, my main conclusion is, yes, we can. This is actually doable. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I'm curious to know, uh, suppose there is a, a sample of uh, absorbing, lemon, uh, absorbed lamin alpha, rather yeah. than emitting lamin alpha. Uh, they would come out, the sample would come out with very similar kind of, uh, of parameters. So how can, you, how can you introduce the transition between lamin alpha emitters and lamin alpha absorbers in, with this technique? Um, I'm, I'm not sure how it would uh, work to apply to absorbers because I haven't tried it, but I'm, I'm, there's nothing in principle that would prevent you from, from doing it. The techniques are quite insensitive to what you put on the y-axis, so you can do whatever, uh, really. Uh, in other words, uh, if I give you uh, properties of a given galaxy, can you predict whether it will be, how do you predict whether it will be emitting or absorbing in advance? So that's the key point. We are all facing this problem. Um, I'm not exactly sure I would do it uh, straight up, but it, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you could adapt a technique to do that, for sure. I mean, if the information is in the other variables, you can get it out, basically, is the idea. But if it isn't, if there is no correlations, the, with absorption or emission strongly which one is which in the other variables, then you obviously can't find it. So it it's, depends on your input variables very much, not so much on the technique, I think. Okay.
No, we actually deliberately kept uh, Lyman alpha parameters out of our, our fit because we want to be able to predict Lyman alpha without actually being able to observe Lyman alpha. For galaxies where there is no Lyman alpha visible, can we do it anyway? I'm not exactly sure because you can do something very similar even if you cut out most of the variable set. So you can, you can remove a, a, a large fraction of it and you can also remove galaxies from it and see what happens then. So it's, it's something we have been looking into in much more detail in, in the work we have, but I can't show it here unfortunately. But you can remove uh, most of the variables and still get a very nice correlation. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for organizing this conference. I'm so happy to be here again amongst all these Lyman Alpha friends. It's really, really great, and uh, it's really great to be in Crete. However, I have to start with a, with a, a confession to you because I cheated uh, on, on all of you. I went to a non-Lyman Alpha conference in Marseille, which was nice because I like conferences around the Mediterranean Sea, and and there I, I learned that there is a lot of. Uh, cold gas in, in, the, in the CGM around galaxies because that was the topic of this, this conference and you guys probably have all seen similar plots before. These are absorption lines of, of quasars, study, uh, measurements of absorption lines of quasars and you measure uh, very large column densities quite far out uh, with large impact parameters and basically every sideline you look at you, you see some neutral hydrogen. Then you can do some uh, photoionization modeling, you get some number density, this gives you a characteristic scale, and this scale in this study by Lam et al. is less than 100 parsec. You can, you can also go to other observables like uh, well, kinematic information or, or neighboring sidelines which, which changes, which basically give you, give you the same picture. Sorry, I have to talk super fast, I have a three minutes less than I thought so. Uh, and, and so now you, you might say, why, why, why do you talk about this gas in the CGM? Nobody cares here. We are at Lyman Alpha conference and you want to talk about Lyman Alpha radiative transfer, but I tried to convince you and Matt already tried to convince you this morning that you should care because Lyman Alpha cares. And I said that before, so I don't have to give this introduction to the left. If you change the column density, you change the spectrum. Or in the bottom, if you change the kinematics, you change the spectrum. But I would just want to talk to the, about this plot on the right because that's something I didn't mention so much. Is like if you also change the structure of, of your neutral gas, you also change the spectrum. So here the column density is left constant, the kinematics is left constant, but I just stratified my medium in a different way. So this FC gives you the mean number of clumps per average line of sight. So if you stratify your medium more and more, you'll get less and less. Uh, more and more smaller and smaller clumps, you see that your spectrum changes uh, quite, quite dramatically. Now some of here, people here don't, don't care about Lyman alpha, they care about Lyman continuum, but they should also care about cold gas in the CGM because obviously uh, Lyman continuum cares, that's super trivial, we, we just heard that if you have more neutral hydrogen, you get a lower escape fraction, if you stratify it more, you get on average a higher escape fraction. So, okay, intro. Now, this is what I want to talk about, uh, uh, this cold gas in the CGM. How, how does it get there? Um, well, why does it move? And, and lastly, uh, how does it affect this Lyman alpha uh, and Lyman, Lyman continuum? And, um, and you, I want to start with question two, actually, which might seem awkward, but I hope later it will be clear why I started with question two. And, and so, why does it move? First, to introduce this, well, uh, you know that galaxies have winds and they, they, they move this, this, uh, this neutral cold gas. You can see this in also absorption line studies here in this review paper, or our favorite emission line, Lyman alpha, uh, is often redshifted. I took this plot from Ryan's uh, paper, and, and that's often interpreted as some form of outflow, right? You know that. So far, so good. But what's, what's strange is, if you look at this uh, problem uh, from a theoretical side, it's actually a bit weird that this cold gas is moving so much because 
well, as a theorist, you write down your code gas. It's a sphere, obviously, and then it has these parameters, uh, density and radius. And if you write down the characteristic time of this problem, the Kevin Helmholtz time, or the Rayleigh Taylor time, because you will accelerate the cloud, or the shock crossing time, all these are similar, and that's the cloud crushing time, TCC here. I don't know, is there a laser? Uh, yeah, TCC there. Um, then you, you, you can see that this uh, cloud crushing time scale is proportional to the radius divided by the wind speed of this hot wind uh, times the square root of the over density. And the over density in galactic uh, environments is usually 100 to 1,000 or so. And then now if you compare this to this uh, drag time, that's the time it takes until you push this cold gas enough until it reaches roughly the wind speed. So this is the acceleration time, so to speak. Then this is also proportional to the radius divided by the wind speed, but it's proportional to the, to the over density, not the square root of the, of the over density. So you see already here that this acceleration time is always much larger than your destruction time of the cloud. And that's not just analytics. Some people need uh, simulations to prove things. So I made a simulation in Athena. This is a slice of a 3D simulation. And the wind is coming from the left. This is the cold gas. And uh, in the top here, you see the time and number of cloud crushing times. And then that's the mass, uh, the cold gas mass there. And you see that it's decreasing quite rapidly. I should also say that these uh, movies are always in the reference frame of the cold gas. So the camera is kind of moving. And that's, that's the speed the cold gas basically have the last thing. And you see now we, we don't have any cold gas left. So that's, that's very strange, right? So how come we see all this cold gas moving in the universe, but it's hard to, to push it with hot gas? And all from, we know from galaxies, right, all that's moving intrinsically, right, is hot gas, like supernova we heard, AGN feedback, whatnot. It, it moves hot gas, right? And, and that's actually kind of a, a long-standing puzzle. People have studied this since quite a while. Uh, like the best paper probably about this was 94 by Klein, McKee, and Colella. And they already pointed out these time scales and this, this problem. And they already said, well, you know what? If you introduce cooling into the problem, maybe, maybe doesn't, there is no problem anymore because cooling creates cold gas, right? So recently there has been uh, people that went up there, Evan skarner Bieko and Evan, Evan Schneider, and they introduced cooling in their code and they tried the same thing. And here's some plots from their papers, and you see the mass fraction of cold gas versus time. And you also see that it's decreasing. Here uh, on the right-hand plot, you see it's increasing a little bit for some. That's because of the cooling. But then it also plummets. So Kevin Helmholtz is winning, which is very strange. And that actually led to this paper by uh, Sung et al. with Ellen Quarter. And, and they, they compared observations of cold gas and, and calculated, well, this is the supernova rate. This is how much we can push. And they said, well, you know, maybe after some time we have still, I don't know, 50% of the cold gas left. Maybe that's enough. But then they, they concluded, no, it's not. And that's led to this title, entrainment is in trouble. So, so how can we do this? And, and uh, so I want to talk about this, this problem. And so we, we revisit this problem and uh, intentionally to do something different with magnetic fields. But then we thought, well, what happens to this cold gas? It's not just gone, right? It, it, you don't really destroy it, you mix it. And, and then you can write down a theory of turbulent mixing layers, and this is done by Begelman and Fabian in the 90s, and they found that the temperature of this mixed gas is actually the geometric mean of this hot and cold temperature. And therefore, due to pressure balance, roughly also the, the density is that. So now you can write down the cooling time of this mixed gas, which is given by this expression. Uh, with usual quantities, and you see that it is larger than the cooling time of your cold gas, of course, but it's not that much larger, right? It's not like orders and orders of magnitude larger. So that leads to an interesting thing, because now if you ask yourself, well, this mixed gas can cool again, so I demand that it cools faster than I can destroy my cloud, well, then you can rewrite this inequality, and you end up with a characteristic uh, cloud size, and for larger clouds, you should cool gas in the wake before you destroy the cloud. So, so let's try this with simulation. So in the upper panel, again, the video I just showed you, in the lower panel we have now a larger cloud where T cool mix divided by T cloud crush is, is smaller than unity. 
And it, I also ran it with higher resolution, by the way. Uh, yeah, and you see that it really recollects there in this tail. And if you look at the mass, it's, it's increasing. So it's not just that you, you manage to entrain it, but in fact, you, you create cold gas. And um, yeah, so we, so yeah, you get this beautiful tail. Looks very pretty. Uh, and I did this not just for this set of parameters, but like different over densities that's denoted by the, what? No, I have nine minutes here. Okay, uh, well, anyway, this is, uh, is going to be funny. So different line styles show different over densities. Different color coding show different, um, this, of this, this ratio I was talking about, the, cool, the cooling time of the mixed gas divided by the cloud crushing time. And you see that if this ratio is larger than unity, so these red lines, it goes down. And for if this uh, ratio is smaller than unity, it goes up. On top of that, you get something for free, and that is because you cool out of this moving hot gas, you get momentum transfer, so you actually entrain faster than you would expect. That is, you see here, because here you normalize the time scale by the drag time, and, and so you see that some of these curves actually reach entrainment faster. So now I'm in my 10th minute, and uh, I can show you that this, I, I tried with different parameters, I can't get into it now, but with different Mach numbers, different cooling floors, heating, and so on, and it still works. So now you might ask, well, this sounds all logical, but why, why didn't other people see that before? And the reason is that you really have to capture the tail. A lot of people, they ran with smaller simulations, although we are in this moving reference frame simulation, it's important that you have a long enough box, and this box has to be pretty long, especially for high over density. So in the lower uh, movie, I show you an over density of 1,000, and you see that this tail gets really, really long. So we find that the required box size is some fraction of the over density. Now, you also might ask, what about magnetic fields? Because magnetic fields, as you all know, they prevent mixing. So maybe this effect then doesn't work. Now, well, Okay, I don't have time, I, don't, I can't show you the movie, but it still works. So you, you have mass growth here in the left panel, and in the right panel you get actually entrainment. And, and the only, it actually is quite similar to the hydro case from these plots, but what is different is this morphology, and that's quite important if you're interested, for example, in 06 or something we already heard about. Now, there is something in the movie, so i show you the movie again, just the last bit, which is strange. So who picks it up? Something that's really, really strange, and you should, you should be like, that's maybe a bug. Because, you know, I told you about that the mixing matters, but you see we are entrained, right? We are basically entrained, but we're still growing mass. That's weird, because there's no more shear, there's no more mixing, so why does it still grow? But the reason is because it's, not, it's actually not producing mass because of shearing, but because of cooling. So you cool, and then you draw in more gas, and then, uh, and then this is kind of a runaway effect. Actually, that's also what happens in this tail. That's, you, you cool in this tail, and then you create a pressure, pre a pressure gradient, sorry, and you draw in uh, new gas from the sides. So, so that's nice. Uh, I don't know how much time I have left, but uh, now I want to get into question number one. <laughs> and, but I kind of already answered, hopefully, a bit of it, and I hope that, well, anyways. So I think this is, might be important for galactic simulations. Because, well, this is this critical like, scale I talked about, right? It's just parsec. But the resolution of current uh, like galactic simulations in the halo or in the CGM is kiloparsec. So that's not good enough. So if maybe you don't, you know, you don't resolve these this clouds that are there. And in fact, if you increase the resolution in the halo, that's done here by Frecke van der Voort. So this red line is uh, with increased spatial resolution in the halo, and you see that they get a higher neutral hydrogen column density. And I bet you that these two simulations, they would have a completely different Lyman alpha outcome or Lyman continuum outcome. And in fact, they also write in their, their paper that this is not yet converged. So maybe you actually need to resolve this scale to achieve convergence. So how many minutes do I have for question number three? No, 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 the, I want, so, okay, I don't, yeah, I am joking. I mean, I don't have time to get into question number three, but there's many more nice talks about this, of course, and mainly I want to point out Mario's talk, which will be right after or soon after. So thanks.
No, no, no. Why not? Well, because it's expensive in the code. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, I mean... Yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true, but uh, yeah, so far we haven't included it, but I, I don't think it changed something in the... It changes, it changes a lot. Okay. Because you, you suppress uh, already data instability by self-gravity. Okay, but I mean the main important thing is the cooling time of the mixed gas. So I, 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 mean, I don't think the, the, the you know, it, dynamics of this mixed gas is important. I mean, even if you destroy, you know, you're saying that you, you change the cloud crushing time scale, you lower the hard cloud crushing time scale. The, the cloud can survive. The cloud can survive. Can, can you survive the other Okay, we, we can talk about this maybe. Thank you so much for organizing this international and uh, interdisciplinary conference. It is really a great pleasure to be here. So um, we have a problem, as we heard many times today, we have a problem with fraction of uh, ionizing photons which could escape. And there are three broad groups how one can solve this problem. The group one, we can reduce opacity. The second solution, we can increase output and we also can, as a third possible solution, we can find new sources which we were previously unaware of or forgot. And this is briefly also outline of my talk. But before looking for a solution of a problem, we should check is there a problem at all? Maybe, uh, maybe, yeah. So, and for doing that, I suggest to go to the, our closest uh, low metallicity dwarf, which is uh, SMC, and specifically to their SMC wing. So, oops, this is, uh, this is, our, this is the SMC wing, and this is our low metallicity, very, very quiescent region uh, where nothing supposed uh, to be happening. However, there's, there's life in the province, and uh, it's quite busy life, and specifically, this is a supergiant shell in the SMC wing with diameter of uh, 600 uh, parsec. So, and we are looking at stars within the supergiant shells, within the supergiant shell. So, one of those stars here is a WO type star, uh, which produces uh, two tens to power 50 ionizing photons. And from UV spectroscopy and from optical spectroscopy, we can probe absorbing column density to the star. And this column density happened to be 10 to 21, um, uh, sorry, it's wrong, uh, wrong units here, centimeter minus two, so this is column density. So this is very high column density, the optical depth to the star would be of order of hundreds. So now we are going to the next object in the supergiant shell, specifically here. This is a, another young star forming region which is called uh, NGC 602, young stellar clusters. Young stellar cluster. Curiously, this uh, very pitiful star cluster with mass only about 100 solar contains uh, perhaps the most massive star in the whole SMC. So this is O2, O3 star, which produces 10 to 49 ionizing photons. We also observe it in uh, UV and in optical and derive column density 10 to 21. Curiously, this guy here, I mean, you, you all know this picture, it's a famous Hubble poster. Curiously, this guy here is a quasar at redshift uh, 2.4, and we can also probe column density to this quasar uh, using this time X-rays, and column density is absolutely the same as column density to the star in this cluster, which means that this absorption is local. It's all sitting around this SMC wing. So we conclude, yes, there is a problem. Everything is fine, we came here not in vain, and of course people already, um, so, so, thought how to solve this problem, and one of the solutions is to account for super bubbles and uh, super shells, and there's a uh, very interesting work uh, 15 years ago by Duff et al, who considered escape of uh, soft radiative transfer of ionizing photons from OB associations. And uh, in this work, they also noticed that uh, clumping the inhomogeneity of the shells these green shells around uh, photoionized region could play a role. However, they noticed that, um, um, as obviously clear, their inhomogeneity 
favors recombination of ionization. Therefore, it actually works counter. It will make the size of photoionized region smaller. That was uh, uh, consideration in their paper. However, we can also consider a different situation. We can consider a situation when the shell becomes really porous and there are also large, on geometric scale, large blow-ups. And this is a situation uh, quite similar to what we were busy also in stellar wind studies over the last decade with uh, porosity and propagation radiation through porous medium. And a uh, couple of formulas now. So in porous medium opacity, we call becomes effective opacity, which is uh, a simple thing. It is just so here I have a source of ionizing radiation, and here is some 3D stochastic uh, medium containing uh, consisting of clumps. So effective opacity when we put rays through this medium is uh, given by a number of uh, clumps per unit volume times cross section of a clump. And now this is important. This is not atomic cross section. This is now geometrical cross section of large structure of large clump. Notice this is not atomic cross section, therefore no dependence on wavelengths here. And here comes dependence on wavelengths here. Uh, so the, the third term in this expre expression for effective opacity is the probability that the photon which hits a clump is absorbed. Yeah, so when optical depths of a clump, now this, is, this depends on frequency. When optical depth of clump is high, each photon which hits clumps is, is absorbed and this term uh, vanishes here, right? So if, if all clumps are optically thick, we have situation where effective opacity determined simply by geometry. It loses wavelength dependence. It depends solely on clump filling factor and clump covering factor. So let's let's make uh, back of the envelope calculations um, about standard kind of making. Uh, actually, when I'm making calculations, I try to to make it uh, to get uh, lower limits. So assuming that average opacity at Lyman um, H is uh, about 10. Uh, per parsec, and the clump is on average 100 times denser than kind of interclump medium, then even small clumps with size of hundreds of parsec becomes optically thick. So meaning that radiation uh, can really only go between clumps and the effective opacity loses its uh, wavelength dependence. It becomes dependent only on geometry. So, can, so meaning effective opacity could become small when, when uh, clump filling factor is small. And how realistic is this assumption as we heard today in the first introductory talk uh, that should be shown um, perhaps by separate work. But there are also a large scale uh, blowouts, large geomet geometrical scale uh, openings exist. And, uh, and for that to, 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 to see how these blowouts work and what creates them, we studied a, a, a complex OB association in large Magellanic cloud. So just to make sure what I'm now talking about, we were a lot concerned with ionization and no, nobody talked yet about stellar winds uh, so far. Therefore, now I will focus more or less on stellar winds. So this is our uh, association N206 in the LMC, which contains, it's a very, very beautiful because it has everything uh, which we need. It has OB stars, it has super bubble which is filled by hot gas, it has supernova, it has high mass X-ray binary, it, it is a beautiful object to study and we took, we just took spectra of all stars in um, this association in, and our student Varsha Raman Chandran, she analyzed all the spectra and produced hedgehog russell diagram of uh, this uh, full complex. So this is hedgehog russell diagram with evolutionary tracks and isochrons, and each star is analyzed by hand, so it's hand work, uh, very delicate and very beautiful. So now we know a lot about the stars, and we see this a couple of monsters sitting here on the top of hedgehog russell diagram with very high luminosities. So the lessons from this uh, comprehensive study was that massive stars are not evil. So even also it looks like a nice blob. No, it is not a star burst in the sense uh, that star formation was going there for 30 million years. And um, uh, the, when we put uh, here um, on this plot is a logarithm of mechanical energy produced by massive stars in, in this association versus spectral subtypes. 
We see that the majority of mechanical energy, again, produced by only three most massive stars with spectral type um, O3, O4, um, most massive objects here. There are also a couple of Wolfraya stars in this association. So Wolfraya stars produce 50% of mechanical energy. So five, only five stars out of, uh, say, 10,000 stars in this complex produce 80% of mechanical energy. And the key point here is that long time average in evolution of such, such star forming complex is comparable uh, with feedback from supernova at the rate which is, uh, which is shown there. So this is a combination of uh, X-ray image and infrared image and there is a chimney through which hot uh, gas escapes. And the key point here that uh, mechanical energy from stellar winds at supernova accumulated over 30 million years exceeds observed mechanic energy, uh, thermalized energy by factor of 15. So there must be a leakage of gas. And this produces this uh, chimney from which our ionizing photons escape. So that was first point about uh, decreasing opacity. Second point about increasing output of ionizing photons. And in my view, the best way to do it is by accounting for continuous star formation. And now I'm going to the third and final point. Maybe we should find new sources of ionizing radiation, which we so far didn't notice or didn't uh, fully pay full attention. And for that, this is X-ray picture of small Magellanic cloud. It's just X-rays. And we see that small Magellanic cloud is full of discrete X-ray sources, and it's filled by hot gas. High mass X-ray binaries. High mass X-ray binaries is neutron star and black hole, which accretes mass from its OB or Wolfraya type companion. Yeah, so SMC is full of uh, these binaries and from study high mass X-ray binaries, uh, we deduce that uh, in the SMC was increase of star formation rate about 40 million years ago and about two million years ago. So observed number of ionizing photons now in the X-rays between 0.2 and uh, 10 keV is three, 10 to 46 times uh, star formation, per star formation rate unit. So the, the key point here is that these ionizing photons produced, so X-ray ionizing photons produced by high mass X-ray binaries, they appear just at the right time and place because supernova already happened and supernova already injected a lot of mechanical energy and momentum and produces blow ups. So everything is now racked and uh, the chimneys and escape corridors through which the ionizing radiation could escape and also heat interstellar uh, interstellar intergalactic medium, it just we heard. So, high mass X-ray binaries found in many famous starbursts, as we heard uh, this morning, for instance, uh, Haro, Haro 11 galaxy. I just uh, uh, want to notice that there are two ULXs, ultraluminous X-ray sources located in the main star forming clumps in this galaxy. And this uh, two ULXs, only two objects, produce about uh, 10 to the 50 ionizing photons. And what is really beautiful, that this ULXs must not be very massive stars, must be not massive stars at all. Mm. <laughs> Shut this chicken. <laughs> Um, so there must not be a massive stars at all, because as we learned in recent years, ULXs could be accreting neutron stars. So quite low normal, uh, normal stellar mass binaries. And ULXs produce powerful outflows, and if they have black holes, they could also make jets. And these outflows have a speed with about 0.1 speed of light. Okay, I must keep majority of my talk. This is, my, this is basically my conclusion. So the picture which we stellar people have in mind is the following. We have a OB association which produces ionization, which was talked a lot about, but it's also very important, it produces powerful stellar winds. So the stellar winds induce, uh, and the cessation induce turbulence, fragmentation, compression, which you also heard today, which leads to the renewal of star formation. These are star forming clumps in the SMC. So star formation is extended last many year, million years. And of course, supernova associated with it. Supernova also produce cosmic rays, also were not, noted, not mentioned here today. And all together, all these processes open the exit from the labyrinth and through which ionizing radiation could hopefully escape. Thank you. Ah, 
Yes, thank you. So there was idea to show that um, maybe you know if you read journal Nature as I do that now there's a big problem in medicine because in medicine all medicine is done by studying mice and people keep pointing out that people are not mice, they are much more complex. My point is here, I talked a lot about SMC and close by galaxies because they are easily accessible to us, but the galaxies in early universe and their massive stars and black holes in the early universe uh, would uh, be different from, from the nearby dwarfs which you see. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you for being here. And I will talk about something very exciting, which is polarization, which you see in the program I will talk about. But first, I will talk about spatial extended Lyman alpha. And that was why it was so interesting that Anne took it up. So first, before do, doing that, I will talk about uh, a motivation for studying Lyman alpha. Well, Lyman alpha is a remarkable probe because it can tell us something, as we heard from Anne, as we heard from Max, we heard like it can tell you something about the gas content, it can tell us something about the kinematics, just by looking at the spectral line of the Lyman alpha profile. Some other questions like not that hard and that aren't that easy to learn from just looking at the spectral lines of a system you don't have any image of is like what is the geometry and similarly even if you have an image of the system you cannot really tell how the Lyman alpha is produced what is powering the Lyman alpha that you see so there's still open questions but we are also talking about remarkable times and I, this beautiful beautiful picture from uh, Muse of Florian's paper here you can see that you can get extended images with extended sources and you get extended spectra so you can learn so much about the system just by looking at that one single transition. And they have some different spectra, you see some different kinematics, you have some ideas of the kinematics, some column density, the surface brightness profiles. And similarly, when you have uh, that's the Dawn Urbic like cosmic web image, and you look at the spatial extent of the spectra, you also see them changing for some reason. And that's like here in the inner region, you have a clear indication of dynamics going on with a strong red peak and a blue peak, but in the outer region you suddenly see a much more symmetric line profile. So what's going on? That really motivates me to talk about modeling really, really simple systems to get a good feeling of the dynamics involved. So first I started out with a simulation. Like I said, there's a spherical simulation. You have a static, static sphere filled with gas. And on the, your right hand side, you see its spectrum. It's a double peak, it indicates the static. It has this, maybe it has a bit weird wing shape. But how can we really tell where different parts of the spectrum originate? Well, that's what's so cool about the new instruments that you can actually start to decouple the different components in the spectrum from where they're originating. So when we look, then I try to do something very similar. We have a symmetric source here. I look at different. Radi different radial components, like a sum of the spectra in annuli of that spherical symmetric system. And then you suddenly see that that broad feature you had in the wing is coming from the central region. And as you look at the outer regions, you have two much more narrower, much narrower, much more, sim not more, similarly sim symmetric double peak line profile indicates on the stack that is, this is system is static. But just to be sure that we're actually seeing some emission coming in from the inside in the middle part, I can know what the Gaussian, and maybe just a normalization effect going on here, what you actually see is that the wing photons from the inner region, where we have a very broad intrinsic em emission profile, like Gaussian with, with 200 kilometers per second, is the wing photons that escape straight from the gas, whereas the line center protons are being scattered through the system and powers the rest of the system. 
So we can test that even more. That's the cool thing about simulations, that you can change the system as you want it. So what if I just, instead of having a wide Gaussian mesh, used to take a narrow delta shape line profile and look at the, the system, again, you see a very flat surface brightness profile. With, you don't have that central region that is bright, where you have the wing photons escaping. But on the whole, it's very similar. But what you see now is that you have at each annulus you see you have the same spectral shape. So that draws this picture. Here I took Mark's observer, and Matt has seen him in some papers. They, you have the photons escaping towards the observer. You can broadly classify what you see depending on, uh, that, just go through the sketch. In the innermost region, you have the photons. If, if you have them, if you have a broad intrinsic line profile, then you might be having some of the wing photons escaping straight at you. That's a way of maybe detecting the intrinsic system in a Lyman alpha system. But in the outer regions, the photons, they scatter through excursions, so they travel out of the path, and they, the system is static, so it doesn't really change, but depending on numbers one or two, and it gives the same line profiles as you saw. And it traces then, the scattered photons then tra traces the CGM the properties of the CGM. OK, let's try to make things a bit more complicated. Now I introduce to you a dynamic system, an outflowing system. You immediately see that from the spectrum. You see a strong red peak, whereas the blue peak here is much fainter. But if you look at the surface brightness profile again, it, it looks quite similar to the other ones. It, this might be some stronger gradient in it, but this strong indication is now from the spectrum. What I do here is to now to bin it with different annuli. I just make many more of the annuli. And then you see is the dark one comes from the inner region, and the bright ones come from the outer regions. OK, so you see like from inner to outer. And then you see as you go further out, this spectrum becomes more symmetric. And you also have an innermost component, and that's why we have the same uh, wide intrinsic line profile, 200 kilometers per second as a dashed line. You see some of it escape straight out. So we can quantify this asymmetry to an asymmetry parameter. So just look at it. And this is just, just the same that I showed you in the previous slide. You see the strong asymmetry is closed to the center of the region. And then as we go further out, the asymmetry in the line profile becomes less and less prominent. And in the innermost region, you don't have that much asymmetry. And just to recap, that's because we have the, the wing photons that are escaping straight out. And that's, that's why you have this very low asymmetry in the middle part. Well, but why are we seeing this change in line profile? And that's, we came across this same thing that old Dorn Ernst in her paper, like you had this change, it becomes more and more symmetric. But this system we know for sure is very, 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 it's moving at the same speed in the outer regions as it's moving in the inner regions. So there's no change in velocity here. But what is, what's changing is the way we look at the system. When you look at the central regions, you're looking straight at the system parallel to the velocity component. And when you look at in the, in the outer regions, the velocity component is going radial outwards. And now you're looking at it at right angles. And then the system, the photons are scattered on the outer regions. The system appears much more optically thin. It almost appears static. That's why you see a much more symmetric line profile. That's very similar to Donner from the inherent work. So that does exactly mean what it means that we have only have a double peak spectrum. It does not mean that the system is not dynamic in the outskirts. It could simply mean that the dynamics are not along the line of sight anymore, of the bulk of the gas. So let's do things a bit more tricky to see. Maybe we can learn use this as a tool to understand what's powering Lyman alpha mission. Uh, here you have a multi-phase medium like full of clumps. One of them is a system where which has a central source, and the other system is where you have the sources distributed all over. And from the surface brightness profiles, it's very hard to tell any difference from these two systems. 
Um, if you look at the spectra again, you have from the inner anus, you have a bright peak for both the extended and the system, and then the you have a central source, and you have, in, when you look at the for outer animus, you see this broad profile, which gives you an indication of the movement of the clumps. But what it doesn't tell you is how, what is actually powering the lime and alpha emission in this system. So, it's an amazing tool, but it cannot tell us all. That's what motivates me to talk about polar polarization of lime and alpha. Because maybe we can use that one to learn, disentangle the, the, the power mechanism of lime and alpha systems. We know that lime and alpha systems can be polarized. And this Matthew Hayes this observe LAB1, and it's like, I'm not an observer, but that looks very painful observing it. Like, I mean, you need to be very careful. Polarization is difficult. You have to, each photon counts, right? It's super painful. But to really fully appreciate polarized lime and alpha, it's good to know that there are two different ways of looking at pol the, the origins of the polarization. You, you might think that polarization is all about the quantum mechanics. That's fine. That's on the photon level, per photon level. But we're not observing single photons. We're observing ensembles of photons. We're learning something about all of the photons. So when you're looking at single photons, how are we actually generating polarization? When you look at this single, you have the two possible excited state that lime and alpha photons can scatter to 2p1 half or 2p3 half. And in 2p1 half, the, 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 the excited state is really, it, uh, it's symmetric, so it doesn't really care what kind of uh, polarization, what kind of direction the incoming photon has. But in the 2p, scattering to the 2p3 half state, there it's really depending on the incoming polarization of the incoming photon. But it also means that if you scatter in certain directions in 2p3 half state, or if it's 2p3 half state, or if it's scattered just further out in the wing, the electron is appearing as a three. Then scattering the 2p3 half state, you can also get some pol pol polarization from unpolarized photons through scattering on this level. Well, that's, that's a lot of quantum mechanics, but the, the, the one message I wanted to take home is this really, really simple one. I was thinking about it from sitting here. So I don't care about that. So we, we move upwards. You imagine a photon moving upwards, right? It will have an electric field in a plane, right? If it's unpolarized, you don't know which direction this photon has an electric component, right? It could be this way, it could be this way, right? But say this photon now scatters to the 2p3 half or the other of an electron, which actually cares about the polarization of the incoming photon. If it scatters towards you, the component of the electric field that was in your direction, it cannot be propagating with the photon because that would mean that the photon has an electric field oscillating in your direction. That's not possible, okay? So if you have a photon with an electric field in your direction, it cannot scatter in this direction. And if it has an unknown polarization of the scattering, it will retain only the, the horizontal component of the electric field, right? So that's how you generate a polarized photon. That's what happens. So say you have some photons scattering this way, but if you can have photons scattering from this side, and then, then the sum of these photons could give you an, a statistical unpolarized signal, right? Because you don't know, you have several photons sitting at you. You count them up, you average over this is total signal. And that brings you to the next, my next point, is the overall pol polarization signal. So what you see here, have a, some simplified systems here. You have a polarized signal that's always appearing tangential to the central source. Why is that? It's the photons escaping, propagating outwards, the escape towards you, and then you have the same effect going on. You can no, they can no longer retain the the electric field that is in your direction. That's why you don't see any polarization coming from the central region, but that's why you see it from the outer region, because the photons are propagating outwards. Okay, so you're thinking, okay, maybe we need to do imaging polarimetry to 
to study polarized properties of the system, now we can also just sum up all of these photons. If you all of these photons, if the system is fully symmetric, you would be expecting no polarization signal from that system. But if the system itself, if you sum up all the polarization photons coming from an asymmetric system, you will be getting a non-zero polarization signal. So to recap, these two systems, they have identical spectra. This spectra is for this one and this one and for that one. It's again, it is a fact that the Lyman alpha photons, they propagate to the part of least opacity, as I said earlier. But in this case, you have no polarization asymmetry. You have mass many photons coming with uh, a vertical and a horizontal polarization or an edge one, but here you have a, a surplus of photon coming with a horizontal polarization signal. That gives the surplus of a horizontal signal. That's one way if you don't really can tell the extent of the source, you can tell, you can actually say something about its geometry, if it's symmetric or not. Next one is the, the other point I just gave you that the polarization for signal would be aligning tangentially to the source. If you have a system that has a central source, the photons will be propagating radially outwards. So even to you have a central region that is much brighter, as the case if you have a bipolar outflow, you can maybe have a central region that is much brighter. But there, from this region, you'll be having a symmetric polarization signal. So that signal, when you take all of these photons, that will cancel it out. But then you have the much fainter region in the cones. And there you have a surplus of photons that are polarized horizontally. So that will give you a non-zero polarization signal. And then you can look at the system for different frequencies. And then you see, as you go further into the wing, that the, the polarization signal will be getting stronger. That's a clear indication of dynamics. And then finally, then, we can use polarization as a tool to disentangle the emission mechanism of, of uh, Lyman alpha. Because in the case you have extended sources, like sources distributed all over the medium, you have no propagation of photons radially outwards for anymore. The photons are produced locally and escape straight at you. And if the photons are generated unpolarized, they will stay escaping straight at you and then be getting an overall much lower polarization signal than if the photons are generated centrally. It's a radius if you have a spherical system, and then you have the, the, the degree of polarization. So you see, the polarization signal is much lower if you have an extended system than if you have a next central source powering it. So it's like that. So that's how I want to wrap it up. It's, there are many, many ways we can use Laman Alpha to learn so much about complex systems, and there's much more we can learn in the future, too. Thank you. Peak separation. Uh, of a if you had plans to model more complex spatially extended media rather than the homogeneous ones that you're doing now to see what happens to both the uh, peak ratio and the separation as well. So not a system like a dynamic system, but a static system, or no? Not static, but expanding, but maybe with a more complex velocity field or density distribution. So we have a system where we try to have a Hubble type outflow, for example. 
Um, then you see you have different hub of just basically you see the same signal as you would be seeing if you have a constant of velocity. Just the photons are scattering out the region if it's optically take, so that's where they get the signature from. And you also see the same kind of asymmetries with different velocities here, 100, 100, a system that's moving radially out at 100 kilometers per second, there's a zero kilometers per second, you see this decrease in asymmetry depending on the uh, outflow velocity. But it's basically just tracing the velocity in the outer region. Plus that. It would be more in terms of destroying uh, the Lyman alpha photons. You haven't modeled like the asymmetries of dust and the effect it has on scattering. But yeah. Okay, so that's time. Um, I have news uh, regarding uh, the boats uh, tomorrow. So the best day to, uh, to take the boat and to go to the tip to the, of the peninsula is tomorrow and not on Thursday because on Thursday we will have uh, probably uh, after 9 o'clock in the morning or 8 o'clock uh, uh, wind, start, strong wind, wind. Tomorrow is the day. Uh, the, the, we need about 40 minutes uh, to go by boat uh, from Colibari, from the harbor of Colibari to the tip of the peninsula. Uh, so if we want to uh, be there by the sunrise at 7 o'clock, we have to leave at 6 o'clock. To be all of, all of us there in Colimbari, you have seen the, the harbor. Um, there is another technical problem that we had not uh, have uh, uh, last time, but um, 